Greetings, fellow investigators, and welcome back to our video podcast, Into the Darkness, where, for a change, my friends and I will attempt to write a complete scenario for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. I'm your host, Tom Rayleigh. Uh, last week, we uh, worked on uh, fleshing out some of the storyline, and uh, we answered some of your questions. Uh, I got uh, quite a few comments this week, so we're just going to answer some of the things that we read. Uh, I, I don't want to read the comments, all, all of them. You can see them in the uh, descriptions. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Oscar did a, uh, um, a an outline for us, which we looked it over. Um, uh, Tyler, you wanted to talk about uh, the copyright issue on... Uh, or yeah, um, apologize for not being here last week. Unfortunately, internet issues and, and all of that fun stuff. Um, and I know that we talked about this, you know, last or you guys talked about this last week, where we had originally decided that we were going to use Golgoroth as we um, as our uh, great old one. Um, but I did a little bit of digging because uh, one of the, the things that we're planning on doing is publishing it, this on the Miskatonic repository, or at least trying to publish this on the Miskatonic repository, which is the drive through RPG uh, site for uh, where amateur publishers like us can uh, put uh, scenarios out for people to purchase or, or download or, or what have you. Um, I started looking into that because I, I do remember, I, I did remember that there was, you know, s some issues that micro or that Chaosium had come out with uh, where you could only use certain, um, uh, certain creatures or certain great old ones. Um, and, and to be sure, I, I also emailed Chaosium and they were nice enough to, to respond back to me. Uh, what it comes down to is there are certain authors uh, or copyright holders which are not either, I, I don't know if it's they're not allowing them to, or uh, it, it just hasn't been worked out yet, um, where the their creations uh, are not allowed to be used uh, by Chaosium under license. And technically, I think when we, when you put something in the Miskatonic repository, uh, it's, it's under the Chaosium banner. So it kind of in, includes this. Uh, and, and I'll send a link uh, so that we can put it in the show notes on, uh, on YouTube. Um, of where the rule of this is, but it's, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. Um, it says, material included in Chaosium products under license, uh, licensed material may not, or sorry, licensed material not available for community use includes, but is not, is not limited to the mythos creations of Ramsey Campbell, the mythos creations of Brian Lumley, and mythos fiction released by Chaosium under license. Please check the copyright statements in your Chaosium products to determine ownership and copyright. Um, so uh, what I took this to mean is if uh, it's not something that is either in the open, I guess, world or whatever you want to call it, uh, that's not under uh, copyright, like uh, I believe Lovecraft's uh, uh, creations are, are not under copyright at, at this time, um, at least the literary ones, uh, but, but others are. And when I looked at it for Golgoroth, I, I want to say it was Lynn Carter, but I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong on that, uh, of who created it. But I could not find a trademark or a copyright on Golgoroth. But to be sure, I you know emailed Chaosium and they said, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, at this time, you know, they're, they we can't use it. So so I know some people have been asking, you know, why you know we we, we moved away from it and what the restrictions were, and that's what what it is. Um, but it just means we get to be more creative. Yeah, I'm curious. You brought up Ramsey Campbell. Did it say we can't use Ramsey Campbell stuff? Yeah, yeah, I know Ramsey Campbell is a Black. big no-no right now. Right. I mean, and if you look at the uh, the seventh edition books, his stuff is in there. Sure. Uh, Glocky and uh, all that stuff. In fact, some of the scenarios that were published um, have that. Uh, but but I do know that you know a couple months ago, probably about six months ago or so. Um, Chaosium did send out a notice to a number of uh, authors and publishers uh, for upcoming books that if they had that material in it, they had to take it out before it was allowed to be published. Wow. So probably some copyright issues that are being worked through. Um, so copyright you know, gotta, is, is a messy place. Yeah. Yeah. I said, just make up our own. But. Yep, exactly. 
And, and uh, I, let me say too, for the record, I'm not speaking on behalf of behalf of Chaosium or Into the Darkness or anything. This is just the research that I did on my own. Could very well be wrong as to the reasoning behind it, um, but you know that's what stated on there, and you know, that's what uh, Chaosium emailed me said. Unfortunately, we can't use it. Better safe than sorry. Yep, yeah. Exactly. Thanks for taking the time to look that up for us. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, uh, one of the things that came up in uh, and some of the things people wrote us was the idea of a uh, sort of a theme theme to our game, whether we wanted to make it, as they said, uh, descent into madness, a treasure hunt, uh, chase against time. And I think that there are elements of some of those things in here, not really the chase against time, but we're lo they're looking for their missing comrades. They're looking for a place to do a movie. They're... Uh, Isolation. Right. It's it's the search, right? The primary plot driver, right, is is this kind of this idea of a search. They're searching for material to film. They're searching for these fossils. They're searching for the missing team. They're looking for something, whatever it is that they happen to be looking for out there. Um, and then the the horror part that that um, comes in is from the the isolation, and then that um. And beyond the isolation, there's a active, uh, basically being hunted. You have this cannibal who's out there after the players. You have these these creatures who want to sacrifice them out there after the players. And so they're now out here alone, kind of oppressed by these threats. So it's a search that uh, turns into survival, I think is the best way to put it. Yeah, yes. pretty much everything's out against them in this. You know, you got the weather turning, you have the creatures. Um... There's a lot, a lot uh, going against them. I think one of the things that's a big positive for this is the fact that it is a search. So it's not something they're going to just, you know, easily abandon and turn around and run because they are hoping. We need to lead them to believe that the paleontologists are alive somewhere, you know, so that they continue to search for their comrades. Maybe right, they once they get, no, yeah, and then they hit that point, and then they get snowed in, and then it's really hard for them to to back out at that point. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. So and it's enough of a hook to get them to where things start to happen. Right. Um, uh, from that that point of view, I think making one of the missing paleontologists could be like the the mentor for one of the new one of the player characters. This is my I, I, my beloved mentor who taught me paleontology, and he's gone missing, and so I have to find him. You know, that's, that's definitely a good um, Yeah. What else did we get? We got uh, some questions about the location of the mine. That's not really that's not really important at this point, uh, but we did come up with the idea that the creatures produce heat during the winter, so if there's snow on the ground, it might melt near the temple or where they are, where they are bivouacked underground. Right, and I think those, those types of decisions can be made by um, the individual who writes those, those Sure, sections. yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And that could lead back to that stone being found. Initially, it was going to be cold, but now it could be extremely hot. It could be hot where the stone is, yeah. Well, hot enough to melt the snow. Um, other things we got were somebody suggested we have a Native American sheriff. Um, I don't know how realistic that is for the 1920s, but maybe, you know. Well, but I mean, if we're saying that, you know, we don't care necessarily about super historic, you know, accuracy. That's true. If, if we have it in this area, there's no reason why we couldn't have a, a Native American uh, sheriff or, you know, NPC or, or, or something like that. Well, and, and if we're going to go with the actual place, Shicha, Shicha um, Hollow, uh, somebody mentioned that Sisterton, uh, Wahai Peton, uh, the reservation uh, has been there since the 1860s, the Lake Traverse Indian Reservation, and that's part of that reservation area. So that, I mean, might... that is something that we can use, but I think the, um, to me, that was primary, it, primarily an inspiration yeah. The scenario. Um, so whether it's that actual location or it's a similar location, um, 
I, I don't really see see too much of a difference, and I really don't want to get too bogged down in the weeds of realism. The details, yeah. Right, we want to we want to tell a good story and have a fun fun scenario. We don't want to get. See, I always find it funny how there could be uh, great old ones and creatures and magic, fighting and all this, but. Oh my God! There wasn't a house on that corner of that street in 1940. <laughs> you know, you gotta have. You know, if you could play with having a demon chasing you, you could play with a slight inaccuracy. <laughs> well, yeah. Not to dismiss it too easily. No. One of the things about Call of Cthulhu is people like to set it in a correct historical place. Mm -hmm. Can't right. have phones in 1792. No, no, right. no. That's the, the historical, the hor historical context of the setting is very, very important. But I mean, this is, uh, in, if you go to this place in real life, there are not sand creatures and a mine and this abandoned ghost town. Just like it, right. or, having the reservation be an, a one mile to the east as opposed to right on Shicha Hollow, right. I don't think should be the big red flag of the. Because it's, right, it's like, if you're going to have a. Uh, include the mountains of madness in a scenario right that's not real at all in antarctica what sorry yeah <laughs> sorry hate to break it to you but i can tell you right where it is past mount erebus <laughs> <laughs> real mountain you're gonna have to cancel those uh, plane tickets I, I do like keeping historical historical accuracy with the proper you know weapons proper houses type of housing type of vehicles you know, but uh, during, having fun with it, right? Right, exactly. Right. So, I one one question that I had, and, and I probably missed it. We probably talked about this, but you know, we, we've got the town, and, and I do have one question about the town. Um, but where the where the um, let me see here where the, the the cannibal is and the abandoned campsites and, and all that in the mine, how far in the ghost town, how far are we having that away from, from the actual town? Um, it, it's, it's far enough, right, where they can't just, you know, walk, say, well, I'm just going to walk back, you know, in, in the snow, even though it's you know going to be six hours and I might die. Right. We, we established that they're going to have to use horses. Okay. And I think we were going to allow maybe a vehicle, but it was going to be treacherous roads, so the vehicle might get bogged down. Okay. No, I think I think if they take a vehicle, it would be lost. And I think that's something the townspeople would warn them about, like, hey, a storm looks like a storm's coming. Your vehicle's not going to do too well out there. You should rent some horses from so and so. Well, or the the town was established and destroyed before there were cars, so there are no car roads going out to the town. The village, the the the, right. the, ghost, the town. ghost town, and the the horse trails have all been overgrown. So, yeah, there's no way for them to drive a car out there. Okay, but we're saying probably it's at least twenty thirty miles. I mean, we don't have to. I'm not looking for us to decide how far how far exactly. I'm just looking for an estimate. No, that's about the range I was thinking. Okay. Twenty thirty miles. Yeah, okay. too far for them to just turn around and head back. Okay. How, how? See, I don't know anything about horses. How far do you ride a horse before you have to let him rest and stop him? Um, if it's twenty miles, then let's make it twenty miles. Okay. I can actually find out somebody who I work with uh, raises horses, so I will yeah. ask her. It suddenly becomes a really interesting question. It, it is. It is, and. You, the, honestly, you know, I mean, you've all run games. You know that there's going to be that one player who says, "Well, no, I could get my horse here because you know." whatever reason i'm just you know i want to make it where it's just on that edge or a little over that edge of where yeah you, you probably should stay there to give them you know incentive to not try to make it back and or if they do want to say well i can take my horse back and they try that there's the uh, the sand creatures now lurking out and about so they yeah. also the horses the horses could be spooked Oh, oh yeah. true. with the curse, the horses could yeah. start acting. And with the storm, they could get turned around and yeah. all sorts of fun stuff. Okay. Um, and then the, the one question that I have on, had on the town, which I don't remember us bringing this up, um, but again, I could be wrong. Um, are we going to have a train, the, 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 town, the, the main town, be a, a train stop as well? 
because I, I did look and there were trains at this time going all throughout South Dakota. Now there were some big areas where there weren't uh, train tracks, um, but I didn't know if we wanted that to be, you know, kind of like a, a train stop. Uh, now we're talking about where the hotel is, where they first get to. Yeah, yeah, where, where they first go, not not the, the ghost town or anything like that. I think that's reasonable. Okay. It wouldn't be like a major train route, but it would. there would be a train that would come through. Okay. Maybe on its way to Fargo. So just doing a brief search, it's saying uh, if a horse is doing a steady trot uh, between five and 10 miles, it'll need to take a rest. Uh, it says though true endurance horses can cover 100 miles in under 10 hours. There are exceptions oh. to this rule. Wow. These won't be those kind of horses. But <laughs> Right. And also it's going to be ice and snow. It's going to be thick, uh, you know, going, so... We'll have Bob's discount horses. That's where they'll get them from. Yeah, they'll be old nags. <laughs> yeah, they could take it halfway through, let them let them graze a little bit and rest for a few minutes. That's when they could start getting spooked initially. Okay, I like that. And then by the time they get approaching their second rest, it starts to snow, and then they're really yep. Yeah. And now if it starts to snow and they immediately run back and dash to town, you could still have the uh, the sand creatures could follow them back and attack the town itself. That's still a possibility. So It snows and the trail disappears entirely. Yep. Because mm -hmm. there really wasn't a trail that they followed. They just... And they'd have to make some, uh, at least a hard uh, riding roll to keep... Uh... Their horses from getting skittish and also slipping on the trail. Yeah, and you can also have the horses turn hostile because if we're having this, these other animals be hostile, their horses could eventually. And the horses are going to know those creatures are coming way before the humans do. We could we could put it into the the the, the, the directions for the GM, say that as soon as you anticipate that the players are going to turn heel and run or decide that they're going to go back to town, that's when the horses suddenly become spooked and all run away. And uh, <laughs> Yeah. Hold yeah. On one second. And it's one thing to, to really, really ditch them, but they also should have the possibility of calling it quits before the mine. They should be able to make it back, right? Uh, well, they could hold up in the uh, ghost town until the storm passes. You know, they, they, they could hold up there and, and, and go back. I just don't want to make it so much to where it's like. And then if they still should have the option of. Right. If they would just have to go through, you know, the cold and mm -hmm. or they could do the logical choice and hold up in the town, build a small fire. Mm -hmm. And then the sand creek just can attack the town. Well, and another thing to keep in mind too, I, and I just looked up to make sure that I was right. Sand dwellers uh, do have a chance to have spells, so we could absolutely have like a, a sand dweller shaman or whatever we want to call it, who has the ability to, I don't know, uh, cast illusions or or whatever we want to to make it, you know, confuse the players to enhance the snowstorm, do whatever the, the keeper needs to kind of push the, the players forward. I, mean, I don't want it to be too railroady, um, but, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, is, is that's going to be the keeper's choice right? Of how, of how they want to run it. We should give them, we should definitely bring up the tools <clears throat> they can use depending on the situation. So, so let's, let's like look that. at it from this point. Now, once, if they make it halfway there and they want to go back, are we definitely going to have the attack on the town happen? Or is that only an option if the players go back? I, I, I don't think that the town is close enough for there to be an attack on the town. I, I just remember a couple of weeks ago we mentioned that, that they might, we go back, they go back to the town and it's emptied out. They were but taken I by... Think, I do think that if the players freak out about I mean they start to suspect that there's something wrong then why don't the sand people realize that and rather than allow these people to go back and tell others they start using illusions and stuff to keep bringing them back to the uh, the ghost town Blair, Blair Witch Project style yeah that sort of stuff 
that's always fun that no matter which direction they go they always end up back at the ghost town <clears throat> i do like that you can also have the cannibal using that kind of magic see him and i, I was definitely going to say he should he definitely has magic because he's already sustained oh, yeah. his life through cannibal magic because yeah. he was going to be a resident of that ghost town he's from the original town possibly town. The founder that was warned by the Indians, don't let people settle there. And yet he did anyway. Yeah. It's a cool idea. So what should we do? Should we look through our uh, our uh, <coughs> working note? I mean, our notes. Let's see. Uh, how we're, Oh, this is how we're going to write it out. Introduction is how, how the, well, what the players know. Uh, keeper's information, what's really going on, the investigators, why they are there. Uh, part one. Now, he, we, we've said the motel, but I don't think motels were a thing in the 1920s. I think that's more 50s. So I say hotel. It's just a small hotel. So. Yeah, so it works. Um, uh, Jason is going to work on uh, NPCs. Okay. Fleshing them out. Um, I think, uh, Jason, you mentioned uh, early, sometime during the week whether you're going to do complete NPCs or partial things. And I think that my guess is that you should probably start with complete ones and right. then we'll decide what's really important because, you know, we only usually put a little bit of thing in there for each NPC. Right. I was thinking like a sheriff would definitely have a complete, you know, character sheet. Um, I don't think like the local general store owner should have a full character sheet. Well, I mean, like, I'll make it as many as you want. It does, it's really right, no they different. Not all of them need full character sheets. There should be a stat block for a lot of them. Right. I was kind of just doing this included where it's like, in case for some reason you needed a stat for a random townsperson. There should be fighting. Um, and there should be uh, hit points. Yeah, any social skills. Yeah, yeah. If they're really wily or you know, something like that. And I and I know that some people disagree on this, and I and I think Oscar is the one who disagree, who is one of the people who disagree on this. But if you've ever read through a scenario and looked through like the NPC stats, you know, every once in a while you'll come across one where the, there's the skill that is not a normal skill like you know you have an old woman and you know make tea 90 percent or something like that um you know ha i it, my opinion of, of that is i i think it's good i think it helps flesh out kind of the personality of the npc without having to write you know this is what they like they like to to do all this um but i i know some disagree with it that so i you know if you want to do that, that'd be, you know, great. Um, I, I like that, actually, because it does make them a little more human, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, her knitting skill. <laughs> yeah. I like that. Because that'll put it in the GM's head to, when you describe the person. Oh, right. the owner, she's sitting there knitting her thing. There's a hot cup of uh, hot pot of tea on the table in front of her. Ba 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 ba. Well, one of the things I really liked in Curse of Nineveh was every time you get a player stat, um, it gives you a little, it gives you first impression, which is, this is what you should convey to the, the player. It gives you the secrets and goals of that person. And then it gives you how, kind of how to play them. Uh, I like that. I yeah. really like that secrets right. and goal and first impression. I yeah. really like that. Right. There, there, are, there are a handful of scenarios that I've read where they do a they do a similar thing. They talk about like what's the motivation, you know, of the NPC. Like what yeah. are they trying to do so you play them correctly. Tom, that was first impression, secrets and goals. What was the third item? Um, uh, playing the character. For instance, um, this is this curse of Nineveh. So I'm not giving you any information you don't already know. Uh, Gregory Bluffstone, uh, the president of the Wentworth Club, says, first impression, large and portly, bearing, uh, almost bald, very large mustache. And it says, personal details, Bluffstone has, oh, I don't want to tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then it says, playing Bluffstone, 
be reserved, dislike in exuberant youth. All right. Uh, yeah, that's, yeah, well, that, that's good okay. for core characters, people to interact with, um, people like the cannibal, maybe a surviving archaeologist or two that they find in the caves who are like, save my life, please. I really like that. And actually, I have a question going with that uh, Morgan just reminded me. Now, we touched briefly, I think, on this, but uh, NPCs with their sanity. Now, the cannibal, he's going to be like batshit crazy, but where, uh, like what, um, like a zero sanity, obviously he's not, but where is the breaking points for NPCs and like what, I mean, the guy's a magic user, he's a cannibal, he's uh, well, probably evil. They're, they're not actually playing, so their they're so, characters are kind of static. Um, I would think of, he can have a zero insanity, a zero sanity and still be diabolic. It's just he has no discernment between what's proper and what's insane. So like, like the stats that we just were talking about, his quality could be that he's very grateful that the players are there. He's so glad to see them, and he greets them with a big smile because he's thinking, geez, I'm almost out of meat, and they happened along just in time. And I can't wait to get them by by themselves so that I can kill them and eat them. And the last winter harvest. But let <laughs> let you know, let the players think that he's just been abandoned there, and he's so glad. You know, uh, that way his complete insanity comes. Now, uh, going along those lines, if they would do a psychology role to find out his motives, what what what's a good counter skill for that? Would that be acting? Would that be? I don't necessarily think that they need a, a counter skill. Um, you don't survive 150 years of being crazy without being able to cover it. Without so, being, well, then they can still look crazy. But if they're going to give, if a player's going to make a psychology role, which they're probably going to because they're paranoid. Right. But, hmm, what is this guy doing? You can, it's up to the keeper really how much they want to give him. Well, when you can write that. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, if somebody passes a cycle, the keeper could say, um, there's something off-putting about it, you know, like the smile just doesn't seem genuine to you or or something like that. Like this guy doesn't really seem like he's in trouble. You could break it into the three levels. You could say if they get a normal cycle, they think there might be, a, you don't trust this guy. But, you know, if they get an extreme, then it's like he's planning on something. Right. He's trying to persuade you to get you to do something. So you yeah, I, I don't think a, I, I don't think what you're maybe wrong, but it, that you're asking if a, uh, a psychology role would be able to tell him that he's crazy. Um, I, I think it might be able to hint at there's something off here. Um, but until the keeper wants to, you know, just completely reveal that the guy is you know crazy and wants to eat them. Of course, the guy is an old man living in a ghost town wearing tatters and rags. I think they're going to think that he's crazy. Right. He can play up crazy. Crazy doesn't mean harmful. That's what he really is. It's incredibly har harmful. Yep. All right. And then also you're getting into this, um, like, making, like, opposed roles that yeah. might bog things down. Like, I don't think he should be, NBC shouldn't, like, try to defend against psychology. Do we do opposed roles anymore in Call of Cthulhu? Is that you do if somebody's trying to, like, kill you. Yeah, I, I think the way that the roles are written is for NPCs, you take their skill, and if it's above 50, they have to get, like, a, a regular success or a hard success, I, something like that. It's dependent upon what their skill level is, what their opposed skill level is. Yeah, opposed opposed tests are really for combat situations or like player against player stuff. And yeah. And besides if they kill him, they kill him. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> murder. Dinner painful. Okay. So we we never really did come up with a name for our town. No, we didn't. Not or yet. For for the yeah, the ghost town. 
Correct. Oh, that's right. We came up with one for the the regular town, didn't we? Which was uh, West Haven. West Haven. West Haven. Okay. So then they kind of threw out there last week. But... And I suggested that uh, the ghost town should have one of those old, old timey names like. Yeah. Um, like uh, I can't remember what I said. Uh, you said something like like prosperity. But we're talking about prosperity. Jason. Paul. Yeah, I, I I wasn't. I don't know. I like the cannibal <laughs> being named Jason, but I don't think the name. I don't know. He brought them there. They found silver. We can't call it Silver City. There's already a Silver City. Um, Copper Town. You know, it's nothing to do with copper. <laughs> Not Silver City. Sand Dweller City. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give the whole thing away. Little Sahara. <laughs> uh, I like the I like the hollow. You know, like uh, Ichabod Crane and uh, Sleepy there, Hollow. There's a St. Elmo in Colorado. Elmo's Hollow? It says St. Elmo. Elmo's Hollow, I like. And we, there's going to be one of those things as you're going into the little ghost town that's got a sign hanging on it that's half hanging. It. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, bitter water or uh, bloody river. I don't know. <laughs> we don't have to come up with a name yet. We can submit a bunch of different names and pick. Um, all right, so we start with the hotel. I'm going to be doing all the, the pictures and cartography. For the... yeah, you're working on the maps. Jason's working on NPCs. I believe that's what um, Zane was going to help you with. Yeah, I'll, I'll start it when he just done with his classes. He can get back on track. I'll be back it. next week. Yeah. And so a lot of the writing then, I guess the writing team here is that Tyler and myself then? Okay. So. All right, so you and I just have to split up <clears throat> these sections here. And then uh, um, Oscar's going to do editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he'll edit together at the end. So, Sailor, do you want to, uh, to me, there's a logical division here um, at like the, uh, around part three, part four, there's like the um, end of the storm and the climax, and then there's like leading up to that. Mm -hmm. And that seems like a, a, a reasonable place to split it, if that works for you. Yeah, I, I'm good with that. Um, let me look at this. Oh yeah, one thing I mentioned, uh, I think before you got on Tyler was, we had talked about there being, we have a film crew that's coming with the paleontologists. Right. Uh, and that they have, we had said they have guides. And I suddenly thought if they have guides that are familiar with this territory, would they say, yeah, we're not going in that area? Because they'd already be familiar with the bad mojo that's going on in that area. Tom, actually, I was thinking about that also. So they could be outdoor guides. They don't have to be from the direct area. I mean, I mean outdoorsmen. Yeah, wilderness is wilderness, generally. You know, if you're familiar with the winter in Colorado, you're familiar with, you know, you may not necessarily know that county, but you know the territory. So what do you call those people? They're not mountaineers because we've got we're not really in the mountains. Currently. Outdoorsmen. Trail Survival. guides, outdoorsmen, survivalists. Trappers. Survivalists. And that leads me to one other question. Are there gonna be other film crew and and paleontologists besides the player characters correct or no 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 because the, the okay. players the players were coming in and the way i see it is the um the archaeologists when they found the bones and they found like these artifacts they got so excited they're like we need more people and equipment 
And so the players are the more people with the equipment, but the team they came to help, the team they came to join pretty much has disappeared. Okay. Okay. And I, I also had a, an idea that it's, it's, it would start with, um, it would start with the paleontologists being contacted and told that their comrades have disappeared and they need to go in there and find out what happened to them. Of course, it's in the police, I guess. Um, no, your, your idea works better. And that the film crew have, have cross purposes. Their one purpose is to film the paleontologists doing their, their digging, but in reality, it's to scope out a Western. Right. And they could have accompanied them, if you're trying to think about how to branch those two together, when these people were preparing to go help make this discovery, the film crew was like, hey, can we tag along and get some footage? And it'll, like, it'll sure. Give the, it'll give the film crew a reason to go wandering. Which so they, then you get the film crew coming in with the archaeologists. Um, and then they already have a reason to work together if some players want to be from the film crew and some want to be from the archaeologists. They have a reason to work together. If they're separate, then the film crew goes wanders off to their own thing. They can find them dead later. Or I know they're all supposed to meet in that town uh, to go on this expedition. Only a group of the paleontologists arrived first, and they decided to go start. And so when our guys get there, they'll wonder, where are our friends who are supposed to be working with us? They'll say, oh, they got impatient and they left. They, they went out there. Okay, that makes sense. And, and so one of them... I'm surprised that they're dead. That they're and dead. one of them was the guy's mentor. Right. They well, just the couldn't, thing, couldn't make it on the same train. If they're impatient and they just leave really quick, though, I'm worried that that would um, lead to less of an investigation in the town. Does that makes sense? That they're really... Because they're like, oh, we just have to go catch up to them. They might just skip hmm. over some stuff. Well, what what are they getting in the town again? It's it's the clues about the mine and the ghost town, right? Right. So I'm just thinking because if if they're going out into the woods because the people who were supposed to help them out might discover it before they do because they were impatient, might lead the players to being impatient. Whereas if this this team, this original team that went out was like, oh, we need some more people. Because this is going to, like, oh, this was way more than we were expecting. We need to expand our operation. And they're calling in for backup. And the backup gets there and it's like, oh, those guys, we haven't seen them come in back to town for a few days. But they still have to go into town to get horses, supplies. And they have to receive a warning not to go out there. From the Indians while they're getting the horses or supplies. The remember we talked there was an Indian leader or something that was gonna try and discourage them. Right. So while they're either at the stable or at the general store or at the diner getting a meal because they just came off of a train or whatever. They have to go to the hotel, they have to get horses, they have to supply. So that's three opportunities for them to run into the warning if they're just trying to rush out of town the warning if done correctly should lead them at least one of the players to want to look into something else they also don't know how to get there so they have to do some research to find out where the ghost town was yeah, but they're not they're not trying to find a ghost town though they're trying to find the camp, the paleontologist camp. Right, but if, if they know that the the paleontologist went to the ghost town, then they'll need to figure out where it is, or that they knew that their camp was near the ghost town, or the, or they heard, or the film crews heard rumors of the ghost town, which would force them to talk with the Indian, because the that that's the only one who knows the real location of it. So there's four opportunities to to get the warning at right, the very the, least. The archaeologists 
wouldn't know that they were camped near a ghost town unless those archaeologists sent back a report saying that they were. Unless they left a note or something like that that said, hey, we're, we're heading out, we're going to this location. Or maybe oh, what we could do is the players were supposed to get there a week ago and they were delayed because of snow even uh, on the tracks or, or something. And so the other paleontology group decided to go on ahead uh, and, you know, to, left a note or something for them to, to catch up to them. And of course they, they didn't leave, you know, where exactly they were going. So that's why the players have to go and figure that out. Yeah, that'll lead the players to search the area. So we have some plot problems there. Let's, that's what we can work on this week. Okay. For the writers. The writers can figure out how do we get past these plot problems. Yeah, we'll figure it out. Because, yeah, there's the other ad additional problem is if we were to have thought that the player, that the, the NPCs went to the ghost town, then our cannibal would have to know something. Like, oh, yeah, 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 your friends were here. Or, I thought he was uh, already going to know that. I don't know. That's I don't know that part of the story yet. But well, he yeah. was... My idea was that we were talking about there were no bodies when you find the destroyed camp because the right. cannibal took half and right. the sand dwellers took half. So he's already can, he's already enjoyed some of the player's friends. The question is, is does he lie to them? No, I haven't seen anybody. If he if he's going to tell them anything, what he's going to tell them is going to lead them into more trouble. Right? He's going to, oh, they went off into where you'll be even more alone. You know, like he will definitely try to misdirect them. I, I would assume that he's going to lead them to where the sand dwellers can attack so he could take ha half of this he party would and give... point them in the direction of the mine entrance. That yeah, way but... they could divvy them up again. Or to the ghost town. He would, he would direct them somewhere where they would... But, uh, so I'm trying to run through it in my head about how, you know, if I was a player... And, you know, we went to a place where there's this crazy guy spouting off. Eventually, somebody's going to figure out that he's a cannibal because they're going to find his, you know, the, the bodies of meat hanging somewhere. And as a keeper, I want that. I want them to, to find that because that's a, an amazing plot point. At that point, they're not going to trust him. Um, I mean, if he says, oh, yeah, they're just over that way, they're just going to you know, say, screw you. you know? if, he, if, he, if he tells them that they're over... Maybe he would point them closer to where they might discover his cannibalism. See, but you're but, right. If he does, I, that is an excellent point, though, that you bring up that I wasn't thinking about. Or if he points them to somewhere that is important, then the players will be like, oh, we can't go there because it was a trap. Well, and, and what if the players kill him? Because let's face it, it it's got to turn into to a combat at some point. Well, I think... Thought he lived in the abandoned town. That's where he still lives to right. this day. Right. So that's the way that the players get from the trail to the town is by, oh yeah, they were here, and then they bring he brings them to the town. Whether they try and kill him there or not, is you know whatever the players do what they want to do. But that's how he they get introduced to the town was through the cannibal. I, I think the cannibal should be played. Like, is it is it Bill from Treasure Island, the guy who's been stranded on the island? So he's crazed and he's nuts and people think that he's harmless. But that he does try to lead them into traps. You know. I, I, I agree. I, I'm just trying to think, you know, I think there needs to be a second clue or, or something with the cannibal that leads them to the mine. Um, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to do anything like a, a journal or something like that. Cause that's been done to death and that's kind of a, an easy way out for the keeper. Um, but I, I'm just thinking, you know, knowing players at some point, they're going to, they're just going to kill him. Or as soon as they find out he's a cannibal, they're going to kill him. And then the information that he has to point them to this other place is, is going to be hanging in the air. It's not going to be able to be conveyed. So we need to have some other way 
for the um, for the players to know that they need to go check out the abandoned mine. Maybe that's where the others are. If the sand dwellers are going to attack them, once they're in the town, once they're snowed in, if if, the, if they don't just kill the players, like if the players survive, and a couple of the sand creatures should run off in the same direction, and then the players could follow them that way if they so chose so so are you talking you know when the the cannibal brings them back to wherever uh his hut or whatever wherever he takes it back to that there are there that there'll be a couple of sand dwellers there as well oh okay now now i see what you're saying if if the if the cannibal does not live in the ghost town i can see what you mean what gets them from the hut well well, i does he live in the ghost town yeah, because he was, yeah. okay. he was the one of the founding members of the town. He's been around since the town was founded there's, in 1880. There's two things I can think of. One is, if they don't completely restrain the crazy guy, uh, they catch him sneaking off to the mine in the middle of the night. You know, he, if, he's not careful enough to not make noise. And he, because he talks to himself or something, and then as he runs off, they they sneak and follow him to the mine, and they want to know what he's doing down there. And the other thing is, is he could just tell them that the other paleontologists went to the mine because they they he told them there were rocks and fossils there, that he saw big big bones sticking out of the, the rocks, which is a lie. It's just wants to get them to go there. Um, I liked it better with him sneaking off in the middle of the night. But they may restrain him. Right, if he's restrained, or if he's dead. Well, I... I already come to the decision to restrain him. They obviously have, there's something wrong with them, which is his cannibalism, so they might just kill him. And I thought there was going to be... (laughs) A diary from the 1800s of like the mother, a mother or a wife of, that lived in the town when the people started going crazy. Remember, they were pulling up those rocks and it was causing them to fight over right, them. She'll, and... she'll talk about the mine, but I'm not sure in a mother's diary she's going to give exact. You could. Could. You could no. have. We, we did mention a, a paleontologist's diary. I know you just said no diary, but. It could be something in there that says the crazy old man says that he's seen fossils at the old mine. We should check that out. And that whether they actually did or not is irrelevant. They might think, well, maybe they did go there. Right, what, what the, the notes that they find the notes, in the yeah. camp when they find it. Because they should find the camp. It shouldn't look like they were, well, it should look a little like they were attacked. But All right, there will be bullet holes through the tents. There will be probably some blood. All right, because these are these are sand monsters we're talking about. They're not going to do the cleanest job. Like the whole place is going to be in tatters. Well, you all, we also talked about the attack. Should the attack come? I, mean, I, I was going to say don't we want to kind of wait a little bit? We want them to first notice that their food is rotting and then that they're kind of trapped. And then it's, and the, 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 uh, the shaman of the uh, sand people is trying to get them just to leave without any need for an attack. The same way he did with the, uh, with the uh, American Indians. Indians and the townspeople. And it's only when they don't go that he attack, they attack. I agree with that. So they get trapped there for at least one night, two nights. That could be at the the peak of the storm, forcing them to stay in the town. And the storm is not supernatural. It's just just happenstance that it happens and, and traps them. Their horses are gone. They can't really see where the trail is anymore. They can't just wander off into the forest without freezing to death. And being that in the town, there'll be ample wood to burn. They'll be, you know, they'll be able to survive there. 
and then they'll be picked off one by one by Cannibal the Hannibal. <laughs> Hannibal, that should be his name. That may definitely get into some copyright issues. <laughs> Named after the ancient king. <laughs> <laughs> What's his last name? Lech. Tor. It'll be <laughs> Han- Hannibal. Hannibal. <laughs> Lepter. Okay, now it's a parody. <laughs> like this old man approaches you the woods and he goes, Oh, crap. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> that, that's not my name. And uh, he stands just perfectly straight. <laughs> I've been expecting you. You have any can tea? All right, so where are we? I, I think we know at least a little bit of what we're going to do by next week. Yeah, so uh, Morgan, is there any you know, like one section that you want to take? or? Um, I was thinking about writing the uh, the first part of it, kind of their introduction to town and then getting out. Okay. Then, Tyler, if you wanted to write from where they meet the cannibal onto the mine. I think okay. good. to kind of get the two halves kind of started. Okay. Next yeah. Week. Yeah, I'll, I'll start on that. Um, Jason, I'll probably hit you up then um, because since you're writing the uh, the NPC stats and all that, especially for the cannibal, that's kind of going to be you're going to kind of be giving him the personality. So um, I'll probably you know hit you up just to kind of get some. Uh, some feedback on that yeah um, i'm gonna probably be hitting both of you up for uh just to go over the list of the people again and okay. then after i finish writing them up i'll just send them out to everybody so that way okay, if any, anybody had any extra ideas on them or oh no i was going this way with it oh okay let's do that and i'll get you guys some blueprints or okay. yeah. plans cool. for the hotel the town the ghost town. I don't think we need the cage of the temple yet. In fact, as, as soon as possible within the next day or so, let's just try and get a list of characters. And don't even have to have the name, just their positions. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you an email, Jason. Well, you know, what, what did, uh, let's see, hold on a second. Uh, we've got, if you look at the thing that Oscar sent us, we've got motel, a uh, hotel staff uh which is yeah. going to be a mom and a pop and maybe a couple of kids kids uh, right general store once again yep. mom and pop yeah. uh garage pop <laughs> yep the the uh, farrier place to rent the place horses, horses. Doctor, doctor sheriff library newspaper and these don't have to be completely fleshed out because they're not going to be able to get back to them to uh to save themselves. And there should be a general store in there also. Yep. Oh, it is there. I there. had my finger right on it. <laughs> you know, Amer- American Indian uh, uh, some tribesmen and then our crazy guy. Plus you got to flesh, you got to kind of come up with, you don't have to come up with stats for the paleontologists, but their names and what they were doing. Yeah, a couple locals in case they just to want to talk to a random person. And then the stats of the uh, sand people, uh, Jojo and Mark Mark. And- now the um, the sand people, that's in the Keeper's Guide, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they'll give you general stats. Yeah, yeah. And there's probably... Oh, five or six thousand of them living under. I don't know how many. Oh, at least. I'll have a specific sheet for each of them. <laughs> the, part of it, it, it's the, the companion manual. <laughs> Sand dwellers in you. Like a stack. Here you go. You know. This book separate. It'll be published separately. Well, you see, and Magnar does not like uh, <laughs> Kothni because Kothni. <laughs> 
He has <laughs> blue. Has, I don't know. I know. Golden. <laughs> this whole complex society. He wanted the whole arm, but Magni just gave him the finger. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right. Cool. I think that we're good. Yeah, I, I think, you know, n next week we will have a um, pretty significant portion of this. And, it, you know, inevitably we're going to rewrite some stuff and that. But, you know, I think between Morgan and I, we can kind of get most of this flushed out and see what everybody likes and kind of go from there. So, Tyler, when you're writing, do you write kind of a narrative and then break it up into the story? I, I do. Um it, it all depends on what I'm writing. Um, if I'm writing a one shot, I typically have the idea in my head. And the, the way that I do it is I just sit down and I start writing. And what, when I, what, uh, what ends up happening is I'll come up with ideas as I'm writing it to, to add into it. Um, and so, and then I'll rewrite it and then rewrite it again. But I found that um, if I just sit down and just kind of dump everything out into the document that, that's in my mind, um, you know, that, that's the most important part is, is to just get it down on paper uh, and then, you know, start going over it. Um, and then, you know, whenever I play test it, I'll come up with stuff in the middle of the play test that I never thought of before based on what the players are doing and, sure. and things like that. But I, but I usually do, you know, what we're doing here is where I'll, I'll outline it um, just so I have a good idea. I do uh, a flow chart kind of like what, um, uh, what Oscar put together, uh, just so I can see where everything feeds in together and if I have any um, uh, choke points that I need to take care of and, and stuff like that. But, cool. but yeah. All right. Let's go ahead and cool. finish this. Uh, uh, our special thanks to Tyler Hudak, uh, Morgan Llewellyn, and Jason Melichuk for their participation in tonight's workshop. Uh, be sure to watch our next episode where we will read more of your suggestions and make some comments. Uh, like, share, and subscribe to our channel and punch that bell icon for updates on our latest shows. And uh, leave us some comments. We enjoy reading them and answering any questions you might have. This is Tom Rayleigh together with all the members of our gaming club inviting you to journey with us once again into the darkness for another adventure into the universe of HP Lovecraft and Call of Cthulhu Roll Playing Game. Until next time, good luck. Good game. Thank you.